Welcome to the Little Falls Area Chamber of Commerce sponsored post-legislative update. My name is Deborah Bowles. I'm the President and CEO of the Little Falls Area Chamber of Commerce that proudly serves all of Morrison County. Our guests today are our elected officials, uh, Senator Paul Gazilka and Representative Ron Cresha. We're going to start off today with each of them giving a brief statement about how they feel the legislative session went and what bills they offered at the, uh, authored that came through. And then we're going to turn it over to our audience here in the council chambers. So we'll uh, be taking questions from our audience, so please have them ready as we go forward. So we'll start now with uh, Representative Cresha making his first statement. And I, I'm not sure, is the microphone on now? Yes. Okay, so it's on. Good. Uh, well, I'm sure you're going to hear a lot of overlap, uh, mainly because Senator Gazelka and I actually work pretty closely down there, and we, I think we know our districts pretty well. So uh, many of the issues that I'm, I'll cover, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to try to cover them all because I'm sure Senator Gazelka will talk about the things that he did um, for our district as well, but a couple of highlights for me. And, I, and by the way, uh, someone asked me, how are you going to define the session? I, I had to think of the Rolling Stones song, right? Uh, you can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. And I think there was a lot of good that came out of it. The education bill, uh, very strong for our schools, very good formula, did very well. And I think that's going to help uh, many of our rural schools. We actually have a higher increase for the rural schools formula than we did the metro schools. Uh, alongside of there, we have some very good teacher licensure reforms. Uh, I was a teacher. I still am a teacher in a lot of regards. But as far as the licensing, what is happening there is going to help us get more teachers into our school systems because, frankly, we have a shortage and a need. Uh, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen was the Opportunity Scholarship for School Choice, allowing people to donate money into a charity that would then award scholarships to low-income kids that could really use uh, getting out of some of their neighborhoods. That was one of the provisions that I would have liked to have seen as a trade-off, but we didn't get it. One other bill uh, among the many things that I accomplished was but my most proud accomplishment was one called McKenna's Law. And that bill allows for any child that turns 10 years old or um, is 10 years old inside of the out-of-home placement for them to make sure they get notification of attorney. Uh, think about this. Uh, and this came to a young lady who basically was in the child protection system, had been removed from her home, and the system was not working in her favor and she actually until her parents took over as guardian or grandparents excuse me took over as guardian of litems she didn't even know she was supposed to get an attorney and the law says you are entitled to an attorney so here was a 10 year old kid at the time 12 when i ran into her who was fighting the system and had access to an attorney and was not told um, and it was interesting because a, a, a number of my opposition on that said, hey, a 10-year-old kid, you know, do they really know what they need? Are they going to be able to waive an attorney? And I looked at them and said, listen, if you're 10 years old and you've been through what these kids have been through, you probably have more maturity than the adults that are supervising you and giving you advice. So yes, let's give them a third-person objective voice that's entitled to it. So uh, that, was a, that was a huge accomplishment for us and uh, some of the work that I continue to do. Uh, there was just a lot of good tax relief uh, that I'm sure Senator Gazelka will talk about and I'll, I'll validate, but I'll turn it over to him and of course we want to get into questions as well. Oh, so good afternoon. I almost said good morning because we always meet in the morning, but here we are at one o'clock, a new leaf. But uh, yeah, it was uh, in many ways a, um, what we have been saying is a uh, historically productive session. Uh, a lot of the things that were in gridlock, somehow we got unlocked and got done. Uh, uh, Real ID was one issue that uh, we've been trying for 10 years. I think we were the last state for Real ID and we, we got that one done. Uh, for those that didn't want a Real ID, we allowed them to be able to not have a Real ID. So those that were concerned concerned about data privacy issues, they can keep a non-real ID, but if you want one, you can get one. So that was a smaller thing that we got done. Uh, the tax bill was $650 million of tax relief. That was the largest tax relief bill in about two decades. I mean, a long, long time. Uh, some highlights of that one, Social Security in income tax for seniors, about the first 300,000 of seniors on, on the lower end that pay income tax as a result of their Social Security income that's now exempt. So they, we got a savings there. Uh, farm ag property tax relief we got. It was similar. It was the exact same language, I believe, as last year, the one that the governor vetoed. This time we got it done. 
Student loan, students with loans, uh, they now get up to a five, uh, $500 credit per year. If they have big student loans, they're going to be able to save some money. Our small businesses on Main Street got a, a break on their business property tax relief. So very big and good tax relief bill. It included local government aid. It included county program aid. So most people consider that a big winner uh, for all of Minnesota, but rural Minnesota in particular. And then we got a transportation bill done. We haven't had a significant transportation bill done since 2008, focused on roads and bridges. Uh, ours was done without a tab fee increase or without a gas tax increase, and that's remarkable. And in that regard, the biggest ever without a tab fee or gas tax geared towards transportation. So, and even that was focused on our rural uh, communities. Uh, towns under 5,000 got a little bit of a benefit. Uh, the bridge portion of that bill was focused on bridges under 7 million, which meant a lot of our rural bridges were going to get some of the resources. So really, really good. Uh, for those that wanted a bonding bill, the bonding bill was over 900 million. Again, we, we put money in that towards roads and bridges, over 250 million. So your overall package for roads and bridges was over $500 million. So it was really a, a good infusion there. And so uh, last thing I'll comment about uh, among many, uh, what Representative Kreischer said about education was very important. Uh, the amount of funding we gave was important, but we included some reforms. Uh, but the last one uh, that we worked on that I can think of right off the top of my head was uh, buffer relief. So the governor had uh, extensive uh, uh, buffer language uh, that really some, some people called a war on agriculture. We tried to slow that date down and, and let people have more time to, to uh, adjust to it. We couldn't do that. But in the end, he did agree that in the first eight months, the penalties would be more of a warning than putting the hammer down, which I thought was very, very important. And then lastly, there was a number of local projects, to, and I want to give uh, Representative Kreisha credit for this. Uh, the opiate pilot, uh, that's really Ron, Ron gets the credit, making that happen. And, and then related to the Camp Ripley Veterans Trail, as the majority leader, I called up Ron. I said, Ron, what's a project that we want to make sure we get done? Ron gave me the, the, the the exact language for the Camp Ripley Veterans Trail, and that got in that bonding bill. So, and the bridge, and the bridge Sioux Line Bridge as well. And so, so it really was Representative Creech and I working together. It's, it's just a real joy. I think our area was rep represented extremely well. Um, you know, in the end, some people said, why did you have a special session? Uh, so at the very, very, very end, we were, we were this close on bills, that in, and then it got this close and this close, and we're just about there. And and the governor and myself and the speaker all said, let's immediately move into a special session. Let's not just send the bills at the end when we're not quite there. Let's take a little extra time. So we took an extra couple days. All of the bills were signed. The tax bill, every bill is signed. Every bill is law. Uh, in the end, uh, th there was some frustration from the governor on a couple of the things he agreed to. And in the end, he, he presently has defunded the House and the Senate. And we'll work through that. Um, I don't think it's constitutional. We'll figure it out. I am in contact with him on a regular basis. We're going to meet tomorrow, and I hope we find a solution. If not, we'll, the courts will have to help us find a solution. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Turn my microphone back on. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, your local chamber of commerce does not have a, a a pact, a political action committee. So any of the lobbying that goes on on behalf of our members happens through the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and the Minnesota Chamber felt that they had a very outstanding year uh, putting forward the agenda that your local grassroots chambers put forward. And we're about to start that process again for 2018. So I will be keeping notes as well today to share with the Minnesota Chamber what issues you bring forward that we can carry forward on your behalf. So at this time, we'll start taking questions from the audience. So please come up to the microphone and again, state your name. And you get a couple minutes to uh, state your case and then you kind of need to wrap it up. We have over 35 people in the room today, so we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance at the microphone if they so wish. So we'll start with our first question. Roman was hooking. There was a lot of talk before the session, a billion and a half surplus, but is it really a billion and a half surplus? The state of Minnesota has $10 billion of unfunded liabilities, $6 billion in transportation, and $4 billion in unfunded pensions. 
and the tax cuts and the shifts that took place in the transportation bill, that's all coming out of, from the general money that normally went to the general fund will go to transportation. How that's going to shake out down the road, I don't know. And a lot of it came out of health and human services. That's what I want to talk about. When the first sessions first started, 350 million was taken out of the rainy day fund to help people with the high insurance costs. That was taken out of the rainy day fund. Then I believe there was, and I'm not quite certain on it because I, I found out of the meeting too late and I didn't look at my notes, but I think there was 530 million to, given to the insurance company out of this budget for uh, stabilizing the insurance market. And I haven't seen any clear benefit that we as insurance premium payers, or I'm on Medicare, but I still pay, pay supplements, stuff that benefit us, us insurance carriers. And the se second thing that we came up, the, the House and the Senate is controlled by the GOP, and the majority of that is close or is rural legislatures. What I, my question is, yeah, and there's a lot of good benefits that came our way for this area or whatever, but our local hospital is going to take approximately $600,000 $600, cuts in Medicare benefits, it's estimated, uh, supplements. How is that going to affect our community? How is it going to affect our, our supplements in this area in rural Minnesota? And we already get a reduced rate, and I can't understand why rural legislators would support that kind of cut for our local hospitals, our health cares, and our facilities, and our human health and human services board. And a lot of these cuts that took place, and I never got the exact figure, I'd like you to give me actual cuts or reduction in the health and human services budget. Thank you. you go first? Sure, I can go. Uh, well, thank you, Roman. Uh, I'll tell you that the health and human services is only gonna get worse. And I don't care who's gonna be in this seat uh, from here on out. The costs are rising at an uh, astronomical rate. What people want uh, is going to be very expensive. And you know, um, I know John, you've written a number of letters. We've gone back and forth about how you have the government play a role in this. What I have found, I mean, if I could say, if I could ma wa wave a magic wand and say, you know what, everyone gets health coverage, not health insurance, but health coverage, I'd absolutely love to do that. The problem is at what expense? You can't put that all on the government's burden with the way we have it set up with mandates and the system. And there are people that want private insurance. So we're gonna have to have a mixed delivery system. And the problem is, uh, and Roman, so you lay this out, we haven't cuts to the hospital, we have cuts to this. Well, how about schools? We put $500 million into schools. We put a number of, uh, how many millions of dollars we put in roads and bridges? 300. 300, so sure, we could have put all that into healthcare and then leave the schools holding the bag with no roads. Then you go down to the state government. It, the, the ball just keeps rolling. I will tell you the budget that you have in place is the best compromise that I believe we could have gotten with the least amount of pain for everybody. And that's hard to do. Um, you can say, well, you have these tax cuts. Okay, we have these tax cuts, but we took care of small businesses. Uh, and Roman, in your last article that uh, you wrote, you said this was for corporations. Well, is Pete and Joy's a corporation? How about the Royal? Is that a large corporation? Those are the folks that we're trying to keep in business when you come into Little Falls. When you go over to Todd County, I go to Long Prairie, you look at the mainstream, Main Street. They're trying to stay alive. They've lost a couple of businesses just in my term here because these costs of staying in business are so high, then you throw the health insurance on top of that and people just say, well, you know what, just do universal health coverage. At what cost? Who's going to pay for that? Uh, I'm just telling you, I mean, you, you look at $10 billion in unfunded liabilities, there's a reason those are there, because we don't have the money. It's, I mean, everything is very, very difficult to manage. And I will tell you, um, we can help one, one side out, we can do a little bit for the, the long-term care like we did two years ago, but then the schools are lining up right behind us and saying, all right, we'll vote you out of office if you don't give us any money. Okay, great. Then I'm gonna hear the hospital say, we're gonna vote you out of office if you don't give us money. Then the cities are going to say, hey, if I don't have LGA, we're going to vote you out of office. Everybody wants to vote me out of office, but nobody wants the job. So. <laughs> I shouldn't even add to that, but I will. 
So we had a $1.65 billion surplus. And keep in mind that four years ago, uh, when the other side had complete power, they raised taxes $2 billion, and then we had a surplus. And so what did we do with that? Well, the first thing we did is we stopped the collapse of the health care industry. It was literally, there was about to be nobody left that was going to provide health insurance for people. Nobody. Um, we stopped that, and I'll find out in the next few weeks, uh, and my hope is that we will have at least least two providers in every county. That would be a big win for rural Minnesota. But that cost us a lot of money. There were individuals who were in that small private market whose rates were going up 67%, $30,000 a year or more for their premium for their family with a $10,000 deductible. It was like they had nothing. And so the reason why their rates went so sky high is we dumped all the high-risk people that were in MSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, that that all went into that small pool, and we expected those other people to pay for that. That was the problem. So we stopped the collapse. We still have a lot of work to do as far as fixing it. So that was over $800 million. Then it was $300 million for transportation, and the rest was tax relief. And so none of those things would I take away from what we did. I think they were all very important. But Roman, the, the uh, concern about uh, the cost of HHS and what is covered in HHS is a very valid point. Uh, this last, this two-year biennium, uh, the growth rate was 20%. No, 20 percent. It's unsustainable. It will gobble up everything else. And so we're trying to figure out how do we reduce the costs and still care for the people. And add to that that at the federal level, they are likely going to cut a billion or more dollars of money that they give us towards HHS. And what are we going to do? And we don't know yet because I don't think they know yet. I think they're close but I don't think they know yet. But let's just say they cut a billion dollars out of our, our budget. What are we going to do about that? Well, right now, Minnesota has substantially more uh, mandated, or, or, or I would say more in their benefit set that we give to people on MA than what the federal government requires. That may be something we have to change. There, there's, you know, the, the people that, are, that they estimate that are getting our welfare benefits that shouldn't get it is about 13%. 13% should not get what we're paying them. We need to deal with that. So there's a number of things we're going to have to deal with. But even if you deal with all of those things, it will not be easy. And uh, that's not part of my job that I'm looking forward to because uh, some tough decisions will be made. But So that's, that's kind of where we're at. I had a chance uh, within the last week to visit with uh, Secretary Price. He's the federal HHS uh, secretary, you know, about what are they going to do. And, and the one thing he said is states are going to have to innovate. States are going to have to lead the way. States are going to have to ask us for waivers or permission to try things, and we want the states to do that. And so I hope Minnesota leads the way. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question or comment? I'm Doug Dahlberg. Uh, first of all, thank you both for coming here today, answering questions. I'm going to um, talk to you as a gambling manager. So I think you know where I'm going with this, Ron. Um, I know you uh, both had talked about tax cuts or whatever, and I guess I'm curious as to charitable gaming taxes, if those are ever going to have a future in that they're not taxed on their gross and taxed on their net like every other entity in the state and, and essentially in the country. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, so I recognize the problem, first of all, and uh, there was a number of things that we wanted to do. This would have been in the want to that didn't happen. Um, I, I can only speak for the Senate. Uh, as the majority leader, I let each of my chairs uh, do about 95% of their work, uh, and my top priorities were the ag property tax relief, the small business property tax relief, and the senior citizens um, tax exemption. The rest of that, they worked around it. Uh, I was very favorable towards this piece, but it didn't make the final piece. Um, but it, for it to work the way it's supposed to, it has to improve. Uh, why a local charitable uh, organization that does collects money on uh, pull tabs or whatever they raise it on, the more money can stay in that local community, the better. And right now, the ratio is not fair. So uh, I, I won't lose sight of it, but I wanted to let you know how that worked in the Senate and, and what we prioritized. I guess and what I'll just add to that, 
yeah, in working with the Exchange Club and all the other service organizations, I understand. Um, it's not fair. I've sat on the Commerce Committee now for four years, and this bill has come up. It's passed out. We're trying to do it. We try to get it in the Tax Committee and through the tax bill. But um, there are people down in St. Paul that enjoy that money. And it, that's what our opposition is. And, and the sad thing for me is, I mean, you look back to what Myron Franz put in place. We're going to fund the, the stadium. Uh, through pull, e pull tabs, and then we we're now using this charitable gaming. Everyone has their hands and their fingers in this down at the state level, and it's very hard to get them to let go of it. Even though the great argument is, yeah, let's if we're going to do this and we're going to raise funds locally, let's use them locally. But that's not what's happening, and so I I completely get it. There, I can tell you, there's a lot of support. I don't know why we can't get it over the hurdle, other than there's some administration obstacles that we haven't been able to get past. We'll keep working on it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next comment or question? 2.30 is a long ways away at this point. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Dave Morissette, and I want to thank you gentlemen for coming today. Uh, I got a question concerning uh, the governor's action as far as not funding the legislature. Uh, how far will this go, or what do you think his strategy is on this? Um, well, it, it, towards the very end of session, there was uh, language in one of the bills that uh, said if you don't give the tax relief, then Minnesota revenue is not funded either. Um, that was submitted to everyone 36 hours ahead of time. Uh, the governor did not see it, nor did his commissioner, uh, nor did apparently the, the leadership of the opposition side in the Senate. Um, but when the governor saw that that was his choice, he was very upset about that. Because I think in the end, he didn't want to do the tax bill. Last year's tax bill was very similar, and 89% of legislators voted for it, but he vetoed it. And so it was a House provision, but it was an accountability provision, basically saying, if, you know, if you're not going to sign the tax bill this year, then why should we fund your side? And so I'm trying to, trying to give you a a perspective from the governor's point of view. And so he decided that he would sign everything but the budget for the House and Senate. Uh, and not just Republicans in the House and Senate, but nonpartisan staff, Democrats, all the families. And so uh, I've been working behind the scenes. Uh, every week I'm talking to the governor, trying to find out if there's some other uh, compromise that we can find. I, I can tell you a number of people on his side of the aisle do not want him to do it. Um, most people think it's un unconstitutional. How can you not fund the House and Senate any more than how could you not fund the judicial branch? It's, it's, it's three branches that have the power, equal power. And so we have uh, uh, obtained an attorney, the House and Senate, together. Uh, we're going to wait one more time to meet with the governor, hoping that we can find a, a way to compromise with him. If not, then our only recourse is to seek legal action. Um, but me, as the leader of the Senate uh, and the leader of the House, I'll say that both of us decided we're not going to defund the Democrats in the House and Senate. We're all going to be in it together um, and try to work with the governor to get past this impasse. I think the comments that I'll add, and I know Senator Gazelka and, and Speaker Doubt, they've been working very hard on this. Frankly, I don't give a damn. I mean, if I don't get paid in six weeks, I don't get paid. Uh, that's not why I signed up for this. However, I think it does speak to the very hyper-partisan nature that we've gotten to. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mr. Watuki, I respect the letters that you put in the paper, but I believe a lot of that comes right from St. Paul Democrats, uh, people that don't know our area. And I work very well with many of the rural Democrats. I work very well with many of the rural Republicans. But what has happened is we have a breakdown of trust. Um, I go back to uh, Governor Dayton certainly has his uh, duties that he needs to fulfill. And I respect and appreciate that as a governor. But your word should mean something down there. And I remember two years ago at the end of the last session when we had an agreement on the education bill, and then he kept backing away from that, and he kept backing away. It's hard to move forward when you're trying in good faith to have agreements. I'm not saying things don't change. I mean, we've all been in negotiations, and I've seen a bill come forward that I said I could support. But when new information came up, you know, things happen. I get that. Mm -hmm. But when your MO is that you're just going to keep changing on us and there's no trust, that becomes very hard. And 
you know, people can say, well, you, you, you pulled a fast on the governor with the, the line in the revenue. Well, if the governor had agreed to that tax bill, as he said he did, then that, shouldn't, that insurance policy should not have met, met one bit of difference for him. Because he, w he had already agreed to the bill, so he should have just been able to say, yeah, this is a no-brainer. You know, I don't appreciate that you did this, but I agreed I was going to sign it. Instead, he decided we're going to spin off on another cycle. Let's go through the news media. And uh, listen, my side does the same thing. And I, I is just as critical with the folks when they do it against the Democrats that I respect. And what I'm telling you is we, as the people, have got to get off of this train. We have got to quit attacking people on both sides who are trying to do the right thing for their communities because this is what it's causing. It's causing the, the point your fingers. It's causing uh, situations where I can't get money for child protection. It's causing situations where I can't hurt, help the people that need it the most because if I take from one pot to move it to the other one, then I get criticized because, oh, you're not for this one anymore. And I'm, I'm just telling you, it, this is us. This is not politics. This is us. Uh, just spend some time on Facebook, and you'll see where this is coming from. Because a lot of times, it's our own family and our own neighbors. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, comment. Step right up. I guess we did have a good session. <laughs> you need to come to the microphone, though, please, Roman. I would just make, like to make one comment about Ron's remark, the people I listen to. I speak with Paul Teasing. I speak with Aaron Murphy. I speak with Melissa Hortman. And they're, they're kind of the power on the Democratic side. Every one that I, in this last letter of mine supported that there would be no cuts in health and human services bill. Hmm. And as we said, things change. Well, that's not passed out of committee either on both sides. So. Right. Okay. Other comments? Hey, come on up. Hey, John, how are you? Ron and Paul, hi. My name is John Gelsa Jr. I'm the mayor of Flensburg. And I know what you mean, Ron, when nobody wants the job, because <laughs> I've been the right in for two terms now. Uh, Flensburg's kind of a unique city. We have farms in our city. We've got beef farms, we've got crop farms, and we have a beautiful turkey farm also. Uh, my question is to you guys, 2015, we had the Roads and Bridges Act. You're talking about pumping money into roads and bridges. Well, Flensburg, we were supposed to get over $64,000 for roads. We don't have any bridges. We have a lot of culverts that need to be fixed. And we got less than 14000 So I was wondering where the other 50000 is. John, was that from... The state, the county, where, who was? Uh, Ron would know more about that yeah, because. I remember when we patched it. I'm going to go back and look because that disbursement, I mean, we, we specifically laid it out for towns under 5,000. Yep. Um, I'm going to follow up because that, I, yeah. I don't know the answer to that, but that, dis that, that concerns me. Yeah, you can send me a check in the mail then. I'll leave you my address. <laughs> I, I might have to take my pay out of it because, as you know, we're not going to get That's okay. I tell you what, we, we had a tariff highway number one, and that's going to cost us some money, so. So the sooner the better, and and uh, thank you guys for. Yeah, I'll, I'll, but I'll get you an answer this week. I'll. Okay. Uh, now, as soon as I leave here, in fact, I'll call down there. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. even in the uh, transportation negotiations, so we have a clause in there that earmarked money for roads and bridges, but the bridges had to be under seven million of value, uh, because it seemed like they always got sucked up into the big bridges in the cities, uh, mm -hmm. and that's that it was a problem. So in the negotiations with the governor, he said, "I don't like this piece," and I said. Well, Governor, the reason why we're doing this is because a lot of those l small bridges are forgotten and we need to yeah, take care of them. Yeah. And the agreement then was we ended up putting two big bridges in the bonding bills, the ones that he wanted. I think in the end his side negotiated one out for some other projects. But point being is we saw that as a real need for rural Minnesota and we, we specifically targeted it that yeah. way, uh, not even knowing that not everybody in the Twin Cities wanted us to do it that way, but it was, it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, one more uh, thing I'd like to mention is that you know we raise a raw product out in our 
city. We need good roads to get that product to the You're processors. Right. So, so yep. I appreciate it then. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. A couple of things related to heavier trucks. We allowed milk trucks to carry a little more weight so they can get their goods to, to market easier. And uh, when there's road construction and a truck is hauling aggregate for the construction, uh, we allowed them to carry more weight. Uh, they have to have more axles. But the benefit there was the Teamsters were not supporting that. But I'm saying, look, we're going to give you $500 million more for roads. You're going to have plenty of work. But by us doing that one change, allowing them to carry a little more weight when they're constructing a road, they're going to be able to do 3 to 4% more roads every year by one little regulation we change. So it's those little things you don't really see, but when you know that people are working on them, they, they make a big difference. Okay. Thank you. Other comments or concerns? Or what would you like to see happen in 2018? I'll give him a couple, before he speaks, I'll give you a couple things that we did not do, I think that were important. Um, we did not uh, do universal health care. People wanted to do that, um, but we felt like the last attempt at that was a debacle and we weren't going to go that way. We did not do tab fee increases. That's what the governor wanted. He also wanted a gas tax increase. We didn't do either one of those. Uh, we no longer have state funding for Southwest Light Rail. That was a big compromise. The governor agreed with us. Uh, that, keep in mind, was $100 million a mile to build, but then the, the cost to operate it was tens of millions. And so we're not, we're allowing the counties in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, if they want to build it themselves, they can, but they can't come back to us and say, we want transportation dollars from the state to operate it. So I thought that was a big win. Uh, outlawed illegal immigrant driver's licenses, repealed Sunday liquor laws, uh, Representative Cresha mentioned uh, that teachers, uh, if a school closes or has to shrink, they no longer have to simply keep the teachers with the most seniority. They can choose to work with their local union and develop a plan that could perhaps keep the best teachers, which might be the older one, but it might be a, a younger one. Uh, we allowed off-duty police to carry uh, their, their, their sidearm in, in public settings. We thought that was a wise idea. Um, we, we talked about overhauling the, the, and streamlining the teacher licensure process. In rural Minnesota, we're having a hard time getting teachers out there. And so what if you have an engineering expert in Carlstead, Minnesota, and he wants to teach a class, he doesn't have to go through the whole system to be able to teach that. So we're going to allow different licenses to allow more people the opportunity to teach, teach our kids. And so just a number of things like that that I thought sometimes you don't hear them, but they actually were things we either did or didn't do that were good. Okay, thank you. Lee? Uh, Lee Boyles from St. Gabe's. I just, just a comment, just want to thank you guys for, especially Representative Cresha for the funding for our opioid uh, bill. The, I mean, I think we're great stewards of our resources and every little bit that you guys help get us really, really does help. And especially as, you know, Roman mentioned and others, you know, the cuts and things like that, we we do the best we can. But um, honestly, those dollars for the opioid, that, that really makes a huge difference. And I mean, this year, I think we're going to be on pace for taking about 200,000 um, I believe about 200,000 narcotic and controlled substance pills off of, you know, out of Morrison County just from our one program alone. And, you know, the other $300,000 grant that we got for the innovation and, and really taking our show on the road and tying into other small communities around the area, that's, that's all because you guys. So thanks for the tough job you do and the funding. Yep. I'll just do a comment. So thanks, Lee. Uh, and I really have to thank Kathy and her team. And I, who else is all here from that? I think I saw... Did I see Ann and um, I don't know who else, but I mean, they, they really are doing all the work. I mean, they, they were down there, they were calling me and very diligent. I, I was just able to shepherd things through, um, had to pull a couple strings, which was fun, but we got it done. Uh, and, and it's important. I mean, and we, we got very, very valuable um, insights into that as listening through that coming through com uh, committee. Uh, the other thing is I, I want to say on the hospitals, and, and Roman, you're right. I mean, what we're doing in the health care is no fun. And, what, you know, we drained the health care access fund to a lot of people who hated that idea. But what else did, choice did we have? Um, we had to leave the rainy day fund intact with the cuts that were coming uh, and the raises uh, in costs is, is astronomically difficult. The one thing about health and human services that people have to understand is we have more people on the government uh, 
dependent on the government right now than we've had. I mean, it's just, I forget what the percentage of how many people have grown. 20%. That comes at a cost. What is it, 21? 20%. 20%. Um, I mean, these are people that are not in the, not in the workforce. These are people that are not uh, getting jobs and paying tax. I mean, so all of this ripples through. And I'll just tell you, it's very, very difficult. I wish there was an easy way to do it. I hated the fact of how we had to do some of the things we had to do. But we had to just keep the ship floating, and, and hopefully we can find um, something down the road that will make it a little bit better. But it's, it's not going to be easy. Anyone else? You, Debbie made a good point. Is there things that we should be looking at for next session? We start February 20th, so we'll be around a little bit. I'm not doing parades. I just want you to know it's the first year I, I need a break. <laughs> but but uh, I might have my legislative assistant raise your hand. I might send him around, too. He's my senior aide, Matt Steele. But, uh, but uh, we want to be available. And if there's an issue that, that you want us to work on, now's the time for us to work on it because it gives us plenty of time to address something as we come in the next session? Or did we solve all problems? I wish. <laughs> Kathy Lang, CHI St. Gabriel's Health. Thank you guys again for helping us out with our opioid project. But as I sat through a couple of health reform committee hearings on the Senate side, uh, Big Pharma was trying to kind of evade the question about um, what they can do to help opioid prevention. And I'm wondering going into the next session, what are the chances of us working on that a little better? I mean, you charge the tobacco companies taxes for uh, the tobacco addiction. Um, why not charge the big pharmaceuticals a fee for uh, marketing a product that caused all this addiction? I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, I, I personally don't like the, the death grip that the big pharmaceuticals have. Um, I understand a lot of the need, and I mean, we're very dependent as a culture on those drugs. Um, it's, it's a tough, dif difficult issue. Um, I don't know what it's going to be. The, the problem, of course, is when you start to just assign taxes to the pharmaceuticals, you may see a hit in revenue, but they're going to pass it on there. I mean, it, it's a really difficult problem, and um, they have a huge grip down there. There's no question. They have a lot of money. Uh, Senator Julie Rosen, you probably know her, but she is carrying that legislation on the, the Senate side. The, I believe it was a 1% or one cent tax, I think it was on a, you know, so we'll, we'll see where that one goes. I will tell you, she was the lead uh, author of the, the meth reform bill of maybe 10, 12 years ago, where we said pseudofedrin had to be behind the counter. Nobody wanted to do that one then, and, you know, once they did that, it really shut down the, a lot of the meth labs here. So uh, I'm not sure where that's going to play out. I will tell you the political ramifications of any tax are difficult in an election year, uh, but the opiate issue is real. Um, I actually love that our area is, is known for, you know, the reason why the area got it run on the House side, but I've got to say the reputation up here is very, very good, and that's, you know, they wanted, when we were trying to shrink that overall budget, that was one of the few areas that got more money, uh, which is really cool, but it also says we got a problem, you know, that uh, we have to deal with, so I'm not sure where that's going to play out. Um, I will tell you, too, I wanted to mention that in the Senate, we have two doctors that are senators. First time that I can think of, we've had two doctors, one's Republican, one's Democrat, and I assigned them to a subcommittee on the costs of health care. Uh, you know, we know insurance, health insurance is a cost, but that's just a reflection of the costs. If the costs go up, your health insurance goes up. And so I've asked them over this from now till next session, look at some of the drivers and is there anything we can do to improve our system? So we'll see what they come up with, but I've, I wanted people in the, that whole area Area that really deal with it every day to be helping us find some solutions. We'll see. Uh, I did have two questions that came into the chamber. Uh, the first one from people who could not be here today. Uh, the first one was Rosie Prisbilla from Marshak Insurance Agency. And she lives in a part of eastern Morrison County that does not have broadband yet. What are the plans going forward to include that area by Buckman? Sure. Well, as you know, uh, we can assign budgets and we can write legislation. I can't tell you who's going to get it. Um, I, I don't have the power to specifically say this area should get broadband. So what we have done is we've designated out diff um, 
areas that are under accessed or have no access, and Eastern Morrison County is one of those. Um, we put in, three years ago, we put in 11. Then we put in 35, so we did a total of 45 this year. We did another 15. So we're up to 60 million that we've done, which is a substantial amount of state subsidy and broadband. Plus, at the federal level, we have the Connect America funds that are coming in, which will be about a half a billion. Now, here's the problem with broadband that I have to remind people of, is even though that money's been coming for four years now, it takes an a, a, um, enormous amount of time to get that into the ground. Uh, we have frost to deal with, we have rocks, we have difficult areas. So everything that's coming now is slowly working its way out to those fringes. And I, I heard this many, many times. People say, well, you pass this broadband money, where is it? Well, it's coming. Um, it, it takes a while to put that infrastructure in place. I can tell you, and I looked at the maps and what we have put out in infrastructure, it's absolutely amazing how much growth is getting into our, our areas. But when you get into Eastern Morrison County and some of these uh, difficult areas up in the Iron Range, there's a reason they don't have broadband because it's very, very difficult and those are the hardest to reach areas to get. So um, the cavalry's coming, it's just I can't tell you how quickly they're gonna get here. Can you address the new satellite technology at all? Yeah, so I mean, you hear a lot in the satellite that you, I mean, and, and technology is coming along in the wireless. We actually did, you're gonna hear some 5G stuff coming. Um, you're gonna see these, as, as far as hotspots are going to give you really good wireless access. So that technology is coming faster than some of the infrastructure, but what Senator Gazelka alluded to with the, ta the satellite, there is satellite technology out there that's starting to give more access to some of these remote areas. A difficult area is it may work for really, um, you know, if you're just using the Internet for simple things where you're not uh, required to download a, a lot of pictures and so forth, but the latency on it is so high that working from home or our telecommunications for medicine, it may, the, the speed's not there yet. So it's coming, but uh, that, that, that technology is all coming around. It's, it's coming faster than, than people expect. So. And the second comment I had was from someone who actually works on a road construction crew that is out there running the equipment. And they felt that there wasn't enough being done in driver's training to help young people understand how to drive through a construction zone. And I'm sure that's your responsibility as well, because. <laughs> I'm smiling because my 16-year-old daughter's right over there, and I'm saying, aren't you getting enough training? But uh, uh, we Actually, can, you know, it's funny what laws you, you address, and that, you know, I'll, I'll take, I'm going to ask, ask my daughter about that after and see, but um, so. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I, I will say on that, I, I have a 15-year-old I'm training now. I've, I've trained two drivers, and the requirements that we now have for how much driving we have to do with these new drivers is way more. Is way more. In <laughs> yeah. fact, it's almost too much. Uh, but so I guess one of the things that I would say and what I'll take from that is, I'll be making sure I take my dry, my new drivers through the construction <laughs> zone so they understand. Because that's, th that's really where it falls on. Yeah. Yes. Parents. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else today? Nope. Bob's going to come up. Okay. Yes, Bob Rukai in Little Falls. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, too, for serving, just like when I see the military. I always want to thank them for serving, too. But something that's never really ever touched on as far as waste in government. Are, what are you seeing at our local level? And then, of course, on the national, it's just absolutely out of mind. Part of the waste is uh, I, I relate to... Um, a lot of regulations and you have the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing so everybody's regulating something and uh, that was one thing I got about I was out in DC for three days last week and that was something that they were all trying to address uh, related to regulations and, and not not taking away from the need to make sure we have a good environment and uh, things like that but that we should be doing things a lot quicker because if, if something takes, for example, uh, copper nickel mining, if they're going to do it up in northeast Minnesota, it shouldn't take 15 years of permitting, which is what it's taken. If, if we're going to do it, it should be in a few years, and therefore you're, you're reducing a lot of waste. So that's a lot of government handling of things over and over. Just to give you one more example related to that, the a, a person in the Minnesota Historical Society actually held up for a number of months that polymet copper nickel mining up north because some possible perceived historical site. Well, it was like 
what in the world are you doing holding up this project? And so the governor, in fact, asked us to change the legislation so we moved the authority out of that into someplace else. So it's that kind of stuff that as we see it, we say, we got to change this, you know, and, and it's hard to change. I've, I've been in this nine years. You know, you see something, it's extremely difficult to bring about the change, but we have to. We, we have to be able to do that. So that's a general answer. Anyone else? We're going to hear from Deb first, and then we'll. Hi, Deb Lowell Morrison, County Auditor Treasurer. And as long as we're talking about next year or something, I'd like um, to see something worked on. Um, I work with our lakes and um, lake improvement districts, like associations, a lot. And they have a lot of trouble getting any kind of funding. It, um, as you know, if you live on a lake, the lake owners are the ones who have to pay for keeping that lake clean, um, pulling the weeds, taking care of the zebra mussels, all that kind of stuff. And so they're looking for ways to fund those kind of activities. Um, one idea that a lot of the lakes have come up with up here is um, like our snowmobile trails, um, they tack a fee on when you register your snowmobile every year, but we don't do that with our boats, our trailers, or any of our water craft. So they're, they're suggesting that as a way to get some funding for some of our lake improvement districts or lake associations to deal with some of these water issues. So just throwing that out there, we're looking for some funding on some of the lakes to help them out. Thank you. So thanks. Roman, come on back. <laughs> I don't know if this is true or facts or fake news or whatever, but I got a couple emails in the last couple days. They said the PCR is back. It is. So I what, what for the audience, I'd like to know the PCR is political contribution refund. And what it does, it takes I feel it takes money out of corporations and big business to fund our local candidates. Mm. Like Ron's, Ron's position here to run for a house seat runs, if he can get, if he got competition, it's going to run him at least $30,000 a year, a $30,000 cycle, roughly, pretty close. What that does is each and every one of you, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you can do $50 per person or or $100 per couple to the candidate of your choice in the state of Minnesota refunds it. I think it's the best policy, and I would like to thank you, legislators, for doing it. I do thank you so in a while. And the GOP draws more money off of it, out of it in the past when it was in effect than the Democrat, but it's a good program. It keeps local people involved. I wish you'd contribute to Ron, Paul, or any other candidate out there that is just for state office, and I thank you for doing that. <laughs> I, th I think, Roman, we, we agree that it is a way that the individual can be engaged. Um, you know, and I talk about Minnesota. It's, Minnesota's not like a lot of the other states out there. Um, the most I can receive from any lobbyist is $1,000. I mean, that's, that's the top donation that anybody can give to any uh, rep le legislator, representative, or Senate. And I, I'm glad, you know, because it means that the individual has more power, more influence, and with the PCR program, you know, it, I think more people will be engaged and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I would just add to that, and, and Roman, you're absolutely right. I'm glad the PCR is back. I, I actually supported it coming back, and there's a couple of reasons. Uh, I mean, it doesn't matter which, which office you're running from and you know, or running for or which party. And, and when Roman comes up here, you know, I'm glad I have loyal opposition. We, we should be testing ourselves and making sure that, you know, the things that we're saying or doing are the truth uh, to the best we can. The, the thing about the political contribution refund program, and as Roman said, you should all write checks out to Paul and I. Uh, <laughs> but what I will add to that, one of the things that's really good about the program is when you donate, that money goes to the candidate and it's reimbursed out of state. It's local. I will tell you, and I mean, we both know this, having the, the big money influence doesn't help anybody down there. And so the more that local candidates can raise money or have local support, the more they're going to be tied to the district, and that's good for, for representation. So I, I'm with you 100% on that one. I think it's good, um, and I, I think it's the right thing to do. Great. Thank you. Come on, come on up. 
Hi, Carol Anderson from Community Development. And just as a point of clarification, Deb, when you mentioned about the Bach and the Ramey exchanges um, for getting rural broadband out, um, Benton Telephone Company wrote some two rural broadband grants, which we supported. They were awarded that money. Um, they are putting um, funding into the Buckman area right now. Um, and then next year, I think they're going to do the Ramey Exchange, which is Eastern Morrison County. They're just finishing up with the Bach Exchange now, which they got funding from before, and they'll be moving back into the Buckman area. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Carol. Can you come up? Oops. Hello. Hey. How are you, Kathy? Yep. I'm Kate Fessler, Ward One. How do how does the state reimburse that money that we were just talking about for candidates? Do they raise taxes somewhere to pay us back? If we pay you fifty dollars, how do you what do you, you use it for your campaign? So what is, how do you pay us back? It's an investment from the state, uh, so we set aside a budget for that uh, that we think people will, will use. So the state wants the individual to be involved in pol the political process, and so that's, that's how it's set up. So rather than uh, more influence for big interest, special interest groups, there's more influence from the individual, which I think is a good thing. Well, yeah, yeah that's, anybody would probably agree with that. Um, but you must raise taxes somewhere to have that fund set aside, right? Is that what you do? It comes out of the general fund. So we didn't raise taxes. We it's within the budget that we have. I mean, it's a it's a massive budget. You know, to be you know, it's forty six billion dollar budget approximately. And so I don't know the number that comes from that. It's not large, but it is a it, it's a number. It doesn't. No. Okay, I suppose it could increase over time if it really took off, but whatever. This $1.7 billion surplus that the state has, um, how, uh, do you have that money? So I, I mentioned earlier it was $1.65 billion. We spent uh, over $800 million to stop the collapse of the health care system. We spent $300 million of that on roads and bridges, and then the rest plus some on tax relief. So if you add up those numbers, that goes over that number. Okay, but that really isn't my question. I guess when, when a family is on a budget, they, uh, the only thing that we really spend that we don't have or haven't earned yet, maybe is for a mortgage or a car. So is this 1.6.5 billion that you're talking about in surplus, has the taxpayer earned that money yet? Well, 650 million of that is going to go back to the taxpayer. And if you think about two years ago, or four years ago, I'm sorry, we raised $2 billion. We thought that some of it should go back to the taxpayer. And I would tell you, Republicans wanted a bigger number than that to go back. But that was the, the number we all agreed on in the end. So that's why we're giving a tax break to seniors, farmers, small business owners, yeah. students, et cetera. But I mean, we haven't actually earned that money yet. No, that'll start uh, after July 1. So we as taxpayers have not actually earned that money yet and paid the state in taxes that money, right? None of the money has gone back to the taxpayer yet. Is that what you're uh, asking or? I, if I think I hear you correct, I mean, starting January 1, you know, we'll start collecting taxes for sales tax, property, all those taxes will start coming in. Yeah. Yes, this is the projected money that's coming in. The money is it's not- It's projected. Yeah, it's projected over the course of, of the budget. Which is two years for what? It, it's a two-year budget, and then every November, every February, and then there's an April, whenever the other time is. But they they 
compare what the estimated with what it actually is, and it changes a little bit every time, but not much. They're they're pretty. Normally, they're pretty close at estimating what it should be. So they don't operate in debt very much. There is what you're saying. Right. We we have to have a balanced budget in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. God, because the federal government does not. But we have to have a balanced budget in Minnesota. I also heard, this is a rumor, a 9.5% tax increase because of it goes back eight years and accumulated. Do you, can you shed any light on, on, on any of that, that we have an increase in taxes due to the, with this year plus the last eight years? Well, more revenue is coming in, but tax brackets have not changed. Uh, sales tax bracket rates have not changed. But as the economy goes, more taxes are coming in. As, as people prosper more, more, more revenue is collected. I don't know if okay. that makes sense or not. But. Yeah. So you are operating pretty efficiently then. I think we could operate a lot more efficiently, <laughs> but uh, that's the nature of where we're at. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for coming. John Snell. Hey, John. Are you saying the tax cuts are revenue neutral? <laughs> no. Because I'm of not more revenue that. coming in? Well, they estimate what revenue is coming in and then what, what amount of tax relief or spending, either one, can fit within those guidelines. And in the end, we have to have a, a budget that balances. And so the budget we passed balances, including into the next couple of years beyond that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but we okay, can never I, spend I more than we have or give more tax relief than we have. Okay. Have either one of you read the ACA, Affordable Care Act? I have not read it cover to cover. I only okay. know of highlights of it. Okay. <laughs> now, you and I, Senator, had an email conversation about health insurance. Okay. And your statement was that it was broken because of severe government interference. Is that correct? I think was your wording. I'm not sure. I, I do hundreds of emails during okay. session every day, but I, the Obamacare took, in my opinion, took the worst of every socialized medicine around the country or nation or world, put them all into one package, and and it failed miserably. In Minnesota, it cost three or four hundred million dollars to set up and something like $50 million a year to run, and all we got was people had less access and significantly higher premiums. And that and that's even, even Governor Dayton said the Affordable Care Act has become unaffordable. And even when we had an audit from our legislative auditor, it's a nonpartisan person named Jim Nobles, he just said they it, it is run terrible, they've inflated numbers, they've not told us accurate information, and it has failed. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, in the future there may be some other government program. There may be. I don't know. Um, because the, the, the problems are complex. Our population is aging, which drives up costs. Everybody demands the latest, greatest technology, and, and some of those things are all cost drivers. If we go to a socialized medicine system, the only way they, they control it is by controlling what what care people get. And we don't let the private sector do that. We don't say when somebody's 75, you can't get a knee surgery or whatever it is. And so these are complex issues. I'm glad I'm there looking at it. But Minsure, which is Minnesota's Obamacare, failed miserably. OK, so let's go back before the Affordable Care Act was passed, before 2010. Yeah. Now, do you think we had more choice at that time? with no government interference, more choice with insurance companies? Absolutely, in Minnesota, without a doubt. In Minnesota, if, if you were uninsurable, you could get MSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, so we took care of those people. Students or, or people under 25, 25 and under, were covered under their parents' plans. Obamacare is six years. But we had all kinds of providers that you could get insurance with that were in the market. Uh, we still mandated too many coverages. We had mandated much more than what the 
federal government required, um, which did not give people as many choices as they sh should have. But saying all of that, I will tell you that it was still, there were still problems. We still have big issues that we have to address. And so the opposing side decided that, that Obamacare was the way we should go. And it didn't work. Um, whether there'll be a solution in the future that's not free market, I don't know. But, you know, that's where it was back then. Well, healthcare has never been in the free market. Yeah. It's privatized. But you can't control private market prices. You can't do it. You're trying to control provider increases with insurance premiums. Doesn't work. Yeah. So let, let, me, let me just say one more thing. This is according to the Kaiser Family Foundation Healthcare Primer. 1999, a family of four, employer-based insurance, was paying $4,700 a year in premiums. In 2010, $15,073. Yeah. So if we had more choice, and less government interference, why did premiums more than triple? Yeah, I, I will not disagree with you that we have a problem, but it has gotten far worse in the last number of years. Last year alone, it went up 67%. I mean, so we have a problem, and it's not health insurance. Health insurance is just a reflection of the cost. Correct. Why? And so what do we, and that's why I said we have formed a subcommittee with two doctors to look at what are the costs and how do we, is there, what are we doing and how do we do it different to, to drive down the cost? That's what I said. You can't control private See, we're, market prices. We're in agreement prices. about that part. Pardon me? We're in agreement about that. Looking but at you, the if cost. you keep it privatized, you're, it's going to keep going up and up and up and up. You spent, what, $860 million for private market premium support? Uh, correct. correct. What are you going to do in three years? Yeah, if we don't control the cost, we all have a problem. No How do you control plan. the cost? It's yeah. private market insurance. It's private market providers. The costs are what you pay at the hospital, the doctor, the clinic, the surgery, the nurse. Correct. Those are the costs. How do you control that in the private market? You can't. Well, and I think I would add to that, the flip side of that is, I, as I hear what you're saying, John, so let's, let's go to socialized medicine. What are people willing to give up? Uh, because what you're going to give up, you're going to ration care. And what, I mean, here's what I hear people say. I mean, I, it, believe me, if everyone here were to say to me, you know what, take us to a socialized medicine system. As your representative, okay, you know, do we get behind that? What's the trade-off to that? The trade-off is right now people like to be able to get a knee surgery when they want a knee surgery. They like to be able to get these other types of um, surgical procedures or other things done that the private market offers. If you know, and even if you look at the socialized medicine across the um, the ocean or other European nations, they all have two markets. So here's the problem we have, folks, that I see. I, I hear what you're saying. And you go look at these, many of them have a private market that's emerging because people want these, they want accessibility to um, surgeries and other procedures that they may not get through the, the, the public market. The question is this, um, what are we willing to give up to get that? And to drive that cost down because th that's really what it's going to come down to is what are we willing to give up? I mean, right now, you know, you have the markets or you can go in and you can schedule a knee surgery and they say, okay, fine, we'll give you that knee surgery when the other knee goes out so we can do them both. I'm just saying this, the, the, the country that we live in and what people want, they're asking for this private market to be in there with a mixed delivery system. So I don't know the right answer to that. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing from the people that are using the, the, the health coverage system now. No, we talked about that. That was Germany, correct? That's one of them. I mean, right, yeah. Right. But, but if, if you go look at all of them, you'll see these private markets emerging because even in Canada, I mean, when I, worked, I, I talked to my legislative uh, peers in Canada, I was with them last summer at a session, and, and the first thing they said to me was, Ron, don't get rid of your market in, in Minnesota. I said, why? They said, well, because when we can't get what we want, we go down and pay cash in Minnesota. Uh, and now, you know, that's, that's an anecdotal single s solution, but I'm telling you, that those are realities that we're seeing out in the market, that, you know, if people want in the day and age that we have today, we have people that are living longer, that want to get hips replaced, that want to get knees replaced so they can golf longer. That's all driving up private costs. What do we do about that? And so, my fear is if we, if we go to, here's my real fear. 
If we go to a system that's completely socialized and a public-based system, the low-income people are going to be forced down into that market where the people that have the means are going to go to a higher private market and get the care, and people are once, going to say, once again going to say it's the haves and the have-nots. How do we get that system in balance? That's what's really difficult. Medicare for all. What, how do we what's pay the for administrative that? cost for Medicare? Yeah, but how do we pay for that? 2%. Which what is it for insurance know. companies? 18%. Yeah. I mean, if it was that simple, we wouldn't have blown the market up the way we did in the last three years. And the insurance that you want is the insurance that you want to pay for. That's what they did in Canada. That's what they voted for. Cheaper premiums, so they wait longer. That's what they voted for. Sure. But, but yeah, and, and, and so let me ask this, because I mean, this is good dialogue. I mean, why don't we have a scenario where I can go in and, with a checklist and say, this is the coverage I want, and I'm willing to pay for that? Because that's not what we have now. It's this is what you're mandated to get, and you're going to pay for that. Right, but what, you might as well give them an all an AFLAC policy, you know, you know if you want to save money. I, I mean, right? when I went to self-employed and we chose just catastrophic insurance and self-funded myself, why, why wasn't that a good option? If I choose as the person who's paying the bills, why can't I choose? And if Aflac's great, great. That's a minimum amount of care, right? Correct. So if somebody, they took away the mandate, and they took away the $130 billion, I'm talking about the Trump administration. They took away the $130 billion over 10 years that was going to go to insurance companies because they knew that they were going to lose money. But that wasn't, that wasn't in the appropriations. So they couldn't, it wasn't appropriated, so they couldn't, Trump could take it away. That's why insurance companies are pulling out of markets. And, These and are you're, more, huh? you're, well, you're a little better versed on that one. I haven't read that detail yet. Well, so. that's why insurance companies are pulling out of markets. These companies are publicly traded. They have shareholder bylaws they have to, they have to adhere to. And they're gonna pull out of the market because they're not gonna make any money. Okay. It's not because of the government. John, it's because I, I, of the market. John, I would encourage you to continue your dialogue with our elected officials, but we're going to move on time. for today. No, actually, thank Thanks. you. I mean, John, you thank know, you. I always appreciate your emails, and yeah. the back and forth is good. Once okay. in a while, I'm, I'm corrected. I know that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, additional comments? I guess we can wrap it up for today, then. We want to thank you both for being here. Do you have any uh, closing statements you'd like to make? I always say it's a pleasure to serve. It really is. Um, you know, just I've been down there more than I was normally, just in the role that I accepted. Uh, but just coming back and just, you know, being in my own bed more and just enjoying the people from up here is just, uh, I absolutely love it. So thank you for letting me serve you. Yeah, I would just add, I know uh, I was giving John a hard time about LGA and all that, but everybody here who's contacted us, um, I hope you know we really try hard to make those issues happen. Uh, it's not always easy, but I, I feel that you have very good representation here, and I know we work very well together across the two bodies, but um, I really appreciate the feedback. Um, when you call, when you send an email, I mean, I hope the experience you've had is when you come down there and uh, we engage that I, I'm giving you my full attention because that's important. Okay, great. Yeah. And I will add my thank you to both of you as well for being here today, to the city of Little Falls for letting us use the council chambers, and to uh, our video guys back there who do their best to uh, record our, our proceedings and play them in heavy rotation. So watch for them on channel 180, is it, Mark? 180 or 181? 180. 180. Great. Spread the word so we get more programming on there. So as always, uh, your Chamber of Commerce is here to help serve our business community. We would be happy to hear from you as well. As I said previously, the Minnesota Chamber is our lobbying branch, but the local chambers, it's a grassroots effort to put forward what the Minnesota Chamber carries forward to the legislature every year. So if I can hear from you, I will certainly forward that along. So uh, on behalf of the chamber we want to thank you for being with us today and again our elected officials are there to hear from you they can't serve us unless they know what your concerns are so let them know thank you john i'm sending that text for flensburg now